Hi, my name is Dr. Della Lynn. Now, getting an infection in a hospital is not anything a patient wants, and certainly not anything that a clinician intends. Yet everyday simple practices, and sometimes because they're so simple, can cause inoculation. There are drifts and practices that happen in our care, not intended, but slips and lapses in our technique. The following is a video. We'll call it the Dirty Dozen. What we have incorporated are 12 hidden errors in this scenario of managing an IV line. And these are all things that can contribute to a central line acquired bloodstream infection. See how many you can identify. After the video, ask yourselves, which of these do you frequently see? What are the challenges that make these practices, these slips and lapses prevalent and standardized practices difficult? Importantly, how might you and your colleagues effectively influence this clinician's choice to change her habits? If she were on your unit, how would you get her to recognize her drifts and practices as a significant drift? And what if this clinician were a very seasoned nurse on your unit? How can you use your role, your expertise, to improve systematic care of the line maintenance in our patient's care? After the video of the Dirty Dozen, you'll see another video without the slips and lapses in technique, and you can use that for comparison. Do look at your own hospital policy because there may be specifics there that you should follow as well. Let's transform those infections that we used to chalk up to as just inevitable to preventable infections. Thank you.
Now that you've seen the Dirty Dozen, let's see the critical steps it takes to prevent an infection during the care and use of a central line. Look, she is using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Doesn't science indicate that cleansing hands with alcohol gel actually is more effective than soap and water when there's no visible soiling? That's right. It's also great that she already placed her mask prior to cleansing her hands. Why? Why is that important? Well, if she masks after cleansing her hands, she may contaminate her hands while putting on the mask. Well, that's a really good point. Looks like she's removing the IV tubing from the catheter. Let's see how she'll maintain aseptic technique when she does that. Excellent. She knows to use a sterile end cap on the tubing. Awesome. That will really help to prevent further contamination of the tubing. That dressing was quite loose. It really needed to be changed. And look, she removed her gloves, threw them in the trash along with the dirty dressing. Remember, it's best practice to re-cleanse your hands after removing soiled gloves and prior to putting on sterile gloves. She's setting up her sterile field and supplies. Be careful when placing items on the sterile field. This patient is very cooperative, but with a non-cooperative patient, they can bounce around quite a bit. So in those situations, you might want to set up on a bedside table. And although it might be tempting, using the patient as a table for a sterile field may not be a good idea. She's doing a great scrub of the area with chorhexidine gluconate. How long are you supposed to scrub the skin? At least 30 seconds or a longer time. It's important to carefully check the written instructions from the manufacturer. Time to scrub varies depending on the product used. 30 seconds seems like a long time from the timer. It might be good to be watching a clock while you're doing this. Wait, I don't see her using three prep sticks like we used to with betadine scrubs. It's not like the betadine preps where you needed three swab sticks. Prepping with chlorhexidine back and forth with lots of friction. Then you're good to go. So now the chlorhexidine needs to air dry for good antimicrobial effect. Wow, that sounds like that might also take a long time. Yes, it does. Some clinicians clean the skin with chlorhexidine using their non-sterile gloves. And then they use the drying time to set up the sterile field. How do you know when the skin is really dry? Technically, the only way to tell is to touch the skin with a finger. Lucky that she's still wearing sterile gloves. That's right. It's tempting to wipe off the excess chlorhexidine with a sterile gauze pad to speed up the drying time. But it's better to allow more time to air dry. You mean no fanning, wiping, or blowing on it? That's correct. It looks like she's taking an extra step in preventing infection. She placed a sponge dressing impregnated with chlorhexidine gluconate. Some hospitals use these all the time, but some only use them in special situations, as suggested by the CDC. Certainly not everyone is using these novel devices, so it's best to check with your own hospital's guidelines. Let's also remember, after applying that dressing, it's important to label your work with your initials and the date. And don't forget to document everything that you've done in the medical record. Another common source of infection is during handling of injection caps. This might include all types of access, such as flushing, connecting tubings, drawing the blood, accessing the y site connector ports, or changing caps. No matter what type of caps are used, a good vigorous scrub with an alcohol pad has been shown to reduce bacterial contamination. It looks like she's scrubbing for a long time. Is that necessary? Yes, absolutely. The timer on the screen reminds us that it's at least 15 seconds. Research shows that a 15 second scrub is necessary to cleanse the connector interface. And don't forget the Y site. It's often forgotten as a source of infection too. When working with central line, there certainly are many steps to follow to ensure patient safety. Even though these steps take extra time and the impact can be hard to immediately see, Avoiding harm from even one bloodstream infection on a patient is huge. And our patients deserve nothing less. That's right.